All right, welcome everyone. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I uh, hope you were inspired by the introduction uh, video um, that was presented as you were all uh, checking in to the presentation today. Um, this is an AIA Chicago Healthcare Knowledge uh, Community hosted event for the design and implementation of the Proton Therapy Treatment Unit at UW Health. Uh, a few um, housekeeping items to go through um, today. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, that will happen through the uh, the Q and A feature as part of the um, the setup that we have. And in order to see the presentation, um, please select speaker to see the presentation in full screen. As we begin our presentation today, we would like to give a special thanks to our 2024 friend sponsors of the AIA Chicago Healthcare Knowledge Community. Special thanks goes to uh, Rada Architects and Smith Group. And our um, HCKC is also supported um, by the 1869 Circle Partners. Please take a moment to, uh, to recognize uh, our partners in sponsorship. And our lead sponsor uh, this year for 2020-2024 is Akimbal International. Um, they just hosted our, uh, our party last week. So we were all together last week uh, for a new year party. And our in-kind sponsors, HKS and Kaylor Slater. Adrian. All right, perfect. Yeah, welcome everyone. We'll get right to it here. Um, but just a quick reminder, if you missed adding your AAA number when registering, be sure to email info at aaachicago.com to make sure that you receive your one hour credit. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Amy and Parsa and the team. Um, wanna just give a thank you to HKS, IMEG and Morton Cullen for giving us their time today. and you know, sharing this awesome project with us. All right. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Today we are presenting this project um, that is located in Madison, Wisconsin for UW Health. It's called the East Park Project. Uh, we're gonna go around and introduce ourselves um, I'm Amy Kirkman. I'm a senior project manager with HKS. I'm Parsa Agai, design professional with HKS. Arak Mazurek, uh, principal structural engineer, uh, Chicago office, HKS. And I'm Jim Scala with IMEG, senior project manager for mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and technology disciplines. Good afternoon. This is Kevin Langan with IMEG, a mechanical engineer, worked on the uh, mechanical, plumbing, fire protection systems for the project. And last but not least, uh, Nick here. I'm with the JP Cullen side of the Mortensen Cullen um, joint venture for the construction management of the project. Project manager. All right. So today uh, we're going to give you an overview of the projects that host the proton therapy at East Park and then talk about proton therapy as to what it is and give you some quick facts about it. Then Amy is gonna talk about the medical planning aspect and the procedures that we went through with different vendors and different disciplines and how she managed the whole project. Rx then is going to talk about the structural part of things. And then IMEG is going to walk us through the MEP challenges, the electrical, mechanical, and fire protection. And then last, we're gonna hear from Morrison Cullen by Nick as to how the construction went, the concrete and everything that they went through and the solutions that they came up with for this project. So to give you an overview of uh, the whole project in grand scheme of things, uh, the project is located in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a 475,000 square feet, uh, seven story ambulatory center. And they have a lot of specialty clinics such as oncology, women's specialized care, multi-specialty clinics, imaging, and of course, radiation oncology. Uh, half of the project from level three and up is um, planned around a scalable modular design where we have exam rooms and different things 
a little in modules that become uh, removed, so there's added flexibility. The project has targeted an lead gold certification and has explored transition to net zero. Uh, we also won the uh, Center for Health Design Touchstone Award in the silver category for the Unbuilt project uh, last year. So this is a site plan of the project. Uh, the building is essentially comprised of three buildings. On the south, we have the garage, and uh, on the south wing, we have a seven-story building, and on the north, we have a five-story building. And all three of these are connected to each other via bridges. Uh, the proton therapy that we're going to talk about most today is situated on the south of the south wing, and then to the north of the proton therapy, there is the rest of the radiation oncology clinics. Um, and here on the stacking diagram, you can see how proton therapy and uh, radiation therapy are situated. They're on the south wing, and then to the left of the radiation therapy, almost half of this radiation therapy block is proton therapy. So what is proton therapy? Uh, currently, there are 44 operating proton centers in the United States. You can see where our um, proton center is located in Madison with UW. Um, there is a lot of peer-reviewed publications that support the use of proton therapy. There are more than 900 articles published in different peer-reviewed journals that support the use of proton therapy and the advantages that it brings to patients. Um, this project is the first proton center in Wisconsin in general, and it's the first proton therapy center that offers um, patients to receive treatment in an upright position. So traditionally, patients receive uh, treatment in proton centers in a prone position where they, lie, where they are lied down. But in this one, we are uh, giving them the opportunity to receive treatment while they're sitting in an upright position. So the uh, equipment that proton therapy is comprised of is first the cyclotron. And what uh, the cyclotron does is it utilizes magnetic magnetic fields to accelerate hydrogen protons up to two thirds of the speed of light and then sends them to these electromagnets. And what the electromagnets do is they try to steer those hydrogen protons into the gantry area. And the gantry is this contraption here. It rotates 360 degrees around the patient to position this nozzle. And then the nozzle is how the proton beams are uh, eventually um, projected at the patient to where the tumor is and where it's needed and scheduled to be um, targeted at. Um, now you might ask, um, this whole situation is very similar to what a linear accelerator does, but the difference uh, between a linear accelerator where we're um, exposing a patient to radiation to remove tumors is that uh, in a traditional radiation therapy, we are not able to specify depths and we are, only, we are essentially exposing the tumor and the surrounding tissues to that radiation. Whereas proton therapy is much more precise and we are able to specify very exactly we want those beams to be and we are able to target specifically where the tissue and the tumor is so that uh, the surrounding tissues are not damaged and there is less uh, ramifications for the patient after the therapy. We're going to um, um, watch a video by Dr. Harari, who is the Director of Radiation Oncology at UW now. Proton beam in 2022 is the most exquisite in precision and lowering the dose to normal tissues. These are sub-millimeter precision. So we can have a tumor in the eye next to the cornea, next to the lens, we can obliterate the tumor and not harm the adjacent structures in the eye. So we need millimeter, submillimeter precision. What will be unique and distinguishing about the Wisconsin Proton Program is we will be the first in the world to have upright radiation where patients are in the upright position much more humane in terms of the interaction of healthcare provider uh, with patient, particularly for children, rather than lying down at a social disadvantage. Worldwide, Proton Beam is the standard of care for children who need radiation. Not only will we be able to serve the 
patients of Wisconsin, be they children, be they adults with complex tumors that warrant uh, proton beam radiation. But the unique aspect of this proton beam program at Wisconsin and the upright technology will attract patients from far-reaching uh, corners of the U.S. There are adult patients that cannot lie flat for treatment. They will be hearing about this opportunity to be in the upright position and receive the highest quality proton beam. This is another step in the continuum of being right at the leading edge in the forefront of technology and innovation in cancer therapy. Amy? I'm waiting for the next slide. There we go. Um, so now we're going to go into a little bit more about the center itself and our planning. So the Poton Therapy at East Park is 22,000 square feet. It's over two levels. The total project cost is 60 million and that includes the equipment. We started our design in January 2022 with construction starting October 22. We had an early foundation package and we are expecting the first patient in 2025. These are uh, overview plans of proton therapy. You can see it is on level one to the left. The rectangle down below is the proton therapy center itself. And as Parsa mentioned, it is adjacent to the radiation oncology department. Uh, those are represented with the three LINACs up above. And then on level two, this is mostly support space, uh, electronics room that supports the equipment. Next. Uh, this is diagram of our planning relationships. You can see the yellow is all UW health space for patients and clinicians. And then the white is where the equipment is housed. So something that's somewhat interesting about this is the white equipment really takes up about half of the floor plate. Uh, patients enter at the main entrance of East Park, and then they follow the red dash line here represented in the diagram. Uh, they come down, there is a reception desk right at the corner there. And then to the left, we have waiting rooms and dressing rooms. The patient then continues on down the corridor to the gantry treatment room, which is the blue circle there. Or they go down the other corridor and or go on to the Leo care room, which is the upright equipment. Both of these um, treatment rooms have control rooms. And then also the accelerator down in the right, that vault also has a control room. So there's three vaults and three control rooms. Uh, in between at the top, we also have an exam room, storage, and then we do have two P prep recovery rooms. Okay, next. On the second level, uh, as I mentioned, this is mostly support space. There aren't any patients up here. So the large L-shaped space is the electronics room. We have the gantry in the center because it's um, taller than one story. We also have some other UW Health uh, electronics rooms and storage rooms. And then there is an office for the gantry um, and accelerator equipment manufacturer who will be on site 24 seven to manage the accelerator. Uh, on the right is a section going through both of those treatment rooms. The large treatment room is the gantry room and you can see the deep pit there. The blue represents that the uh, there is a rope opening in the roof and there will be a crane that will uh, bring the large gantry into this vault. Uh, there's also a crane built into the vault itself that will get it to the exact location. And then the roof will be infilled with precast planks. Over to the left is the smaller uh, vault, which is for the Leo Care upright equipment. Uh, the nozzle for that comes in through the, an opening in the side of the vault, and then that will be infilled with high density block. And then to the left of the slide, we're showing the uh, electrical area at the top, the gantry in the middle, and then there are two air handlers that support the proton therapy. Next. Um, I want, want to talk a little bit about our design process. So we do have an international team with the accelerator and gantry manufacturer uh, being in Japan. The upright treatment equipment is from UK, and then the architecture, engineering, and shielding physicists are from the United States. 
And I would say this is this process is a little bit more iterative than most in that the equipment is really being designed at the same time that we're designing the building. Next. Uh, we did have two tracks of meetings, the project team meetings. Uh, we met weekly during schematic design, design development, and then now our meeting uh, biweekly during construction documents and construction. Uh, that group consisted of the planning, design, and construction from UW Health, photon consultant, architect, engineers, contractor, and then both manufacturers of the equipment. Along with that, we had the second track, which was physician, uh, physicists, physicians, therapists, and nursing um, that formed a standard user group. We had three SD meetings and seven DD meetings. We also, as a team, went on two site visits. One was to visit uh, Leo Care's Research and Development Center that is in Madison, Wisconsin. And then here you can see a prototype of the revolving chair. And then the second uh, site visit was to Proton Therapy in Washington, DC. And this is where we view the gantry rooms. At this uh, facility, they have three gantry rooms. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Arik for structural engineering. Hello. Um, so not too often structural engineer can say that uh, we have too much too much structure. Uh, amount of concrete needed for this uh, building because of radiation uh, made my my work really really easy. Um, so most complicated might be the mass concrete construction, but I'm not going to steal the thunder from Nick. So I'm not going to talk about this, but um, uh, what what we what what I wanted to say is that I I selected a couple um, ideas that were important for this project, but they can be related to other projects as well. Um, purpose of drawings uh, is not only to define the the design, but also to relate uh, the intent of the design in, in clean way. So because of compl complexity of the geometry and how much uh, how much things were going on in the design, um, we thought that we're going to place the picture that we see on screen in drawings. And it was more for us to understand what's, what's happening. Um, but uh, one day uh, I was really pleasantly surprised. I, I got an RFI because something was observed in this particular graphic. Uh, and there was a question uh, related to it that meant that uh, people are using it. Okay, so picture something is worth a thousand words, um, and uh, you know we didn't add any content in this graphic, but we definitely helped understanding the structure. Next, so any small me small is a, a quote stolen from a movie that has nothing to do with buildings, but uh, it's a kind of my motto if. Uh, if we look at the details and uh, when we really particular about small things, we're not going to do big mistakes. And uh, what this building was about is about the proton traveling with uh, high speed, uh, about the trajectory that has a very small tolerance. So uh, that, that's a plan view of, uh, of floor area where all the magic is happening. So the, the red lines represent the, the, the path of, those, of the proton traveling. and uh, um, because the building is built around this this path, that's our reference point. And understanding that everything is built in reference to those red lines was very critical to uh, to being accurate and uh, having uh, small um, small attention to, to to small details uh, and avoiding large uh, large mistakes. What also was interesting about this is that. The equipment was in metric units, and the construction was in imperial. And uh, whatever we felt, it's uh, it was important for the equipment installation. We did have dual um, uh, dimension lines with metric and uh, imperial that helped explain why those imperial numbers are so odd in fractions. Um, and this helped also contractor to um, to aim small. Okay, next. Uh, understanding design criteria was very important for this building. Uh, we did get very tight tolerances from Hitachi. Um, if, if you can imagine, uh, the the uh, the equipment can move 
uh, a quarter inch distance over the length of a swimming pool. Okay, the rotation um, over the length of a swimming pool is a quarter inch or less. Uh, these are very tight tolerances and understanding that this movement can happen after installation of the equipment was really critical because what structural engineers typically do, they model the building and in the model, they turn on the uh, gravity and then everything moves. Uh, and it moves much more than a quarter inch, uh, but understanding the time at what the equipment is installed and calibrated and the movement after that, the creep and shrinkage of concrete uh, and the temp thermal displacements uh, helps minimize the cost of the structure. Next. Uh, this one, definitely you don't hear much from structural engineers, structural subtraction. Uh, so uh, there is always multiple solutions within the structure. Okay, So if a brace goes through a window, through a door, it can be moved, it can be reversed. Uh, there is always uh, multiple solutions to that. So he, here we implemented an option that we move the work point from the brace to avoid the uh, conflicts with, with windows. And uh, next. And uh, also sometimes when, when you're putting a structure in the building, it's permanent. It's very difficult to change it after that. So you might think that, okay, a column here and there is fine, but if there are other options, um, maybe it's better to move it away because maybe in the future it may be an obstacle. What we see on the screen here is on the left is a gantry room. There was a big machine uh, inside. At the top, um, we see crane. Uh, during installation, those uh, concrete rectangular planks are not there. Uh, it's going to be closed after the installation of equipment. Um, the crane is very close to the architectural wall. And uh, it took a little bit of coordination with uh, architects to realize that, okay, we can move the column, the, 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 the uh, column on the right, and we can go to the next slide. We can move it up, uh, up to the concrete. And, uh, you know, it, it, what, it, there was enough space for the column to be there, but we moved it away for future in case we need the space. And the, the side effect of this was actually the structure became uh, cheaper because the, the column got shorter, right? So. And Kevin? Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute there. Um, on the electrical side, when we started the building, some of our guiding principles were lead and sustainability. And in this photo on the right-hand side is our parking deck. And we ended up uh, installing a uh, solar array uh, on the complete upper deck that provided about one megawatt of power. And it, and it offsets the proton therapy. So what proton therapy kind of came late in the project and we solidified adding the PV array. Again, it's about one megawatt. It provides vehicle protection on the garage. We ended up putting gutter systems and drainage and electric heat trace um, because we are in Madison, Wisconsin with the ice and snow climate. So there was some challenges in that, but it, that's how it does relate to Proton. The uh, Proton facilities on the left side of the, the picture there. Next slide. So the vendor specific power requirements uh, were pretty stringent for voltage, frequency, and harmonics. Uh, to that end, we ended up providing a dedicated electrical service just for this Proton edition. Um, also dedicated switch gear. And the major power needs are the accelerator itself, the gantry, and the, uh, the fixed beam rooms. We do have a uninterruptible power source that serves uh, some of the equipment. It does not allow the procedure to take place. What it does, though, it mitigates downtime uh, and protects critical data, IT systems, process water cooling, and vacuum pumps on the accelerator. So as normal power, if, you do, if we do have a normal power outage when power comes back, it, it kind of mitigates the time to reestablish and set back up. So if you could scan down a little more, Parsa. Uh, a couple of the aspects here are radiation safety for the personnel operating the space. Uh, there's a pretty complex control system we had to design in uh, the rooms to make sure there's no personnel in there when the beam is being fired. 
A lot of interfaces between door switches, room status indicators, warning lights, all of that interfaces with the vendor equipment and enables the beam to actually be fired once all those rooms are, are technically cleared. Uh, but that's a pretty important aspect of the project. Uh, the last part that was really challenging is a complex pathway network uh, consisting of cable trays and buried conduit systems. Nick from Martinson Cullen is going to talk a little bit more, but we had we couldn't use uh, PVC conduits that were buried in the concrete because of the elevated temperatures of the curing. So we ended up having to use fiberglass conduits as well as cable trays. We have stacked cable trays all over the place. Some of them are four deep. Uh, so when it came to building information modeling, uh, there was a lot of accuracy that had to be put into that design. So I'll let Kevin talk about mechanical at this point. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, so kind of going through some of the mechanical highlights here within the, the proton therapy. So Parsa kind of talked about a little bit how this is similar to a LINAC, but it's not really. Um, and to kind of put that in perspective from a, a mechanical cooling uh, standpoint, so that this addition represents about 5% of the building area, this proton center. Um, but from a cooling perspective, we're using about a fifth of the total cooling for the entire facility, that half million square foot facility is just going to this proton therapy. Um, and that, that's a combination of process cooling. So we have like a process cooling loop that's providing uh, cool water to the actual proton equipment to those magnets, to those power supplies, to that accelerator, and then also air handling systems that are cooling the spaces themselves. So it's very similar to what we would do in a typical facility, but everything's kind of another level. Um, so for instance, in that process cooling, we don't just have normal treated cooling water uh, going to this equipment. It has to be a very high purity water. It's in a very high magnetic field environment. Uh, we don't want to disrupt the operation of that proton equipment. So this is a extremely high purity water. We have um, kind of filters that are constantly purifying that water to make sure we don't lose that purity. Um, and then we also have, if that filled water system ever goes down, there's a domestic water backup so we can cool the proton therapy equipment with a heat exchanger that's going to domestic water. Just again, a, a level of redundancy so that we don't have a downtime so we don't have issues if the main building cooling system shuts down for whatever reason. Uh, the other thing, uh, as Jim mentioned, this is a project overall. Uh, it's a lead project. We're, we're trying to be very conscious with our energy use. So with this proton equipment, one of the things we, we realized very quickly early on is it needs a lot of cooling, including in the dead of winter up in Wisconsin. So we're taking that cooling. We have energy recovery chiller, and we're taking that waste heat from the proton therapy and we're using that to heat the facility. So we're able to kind of make use of that in the winter. So it, it cuts down in our natural gas use in the facility, just taking all that waste heat from the, the proton equipment. Um, from air handling unit perspective, uh, Amy kind of pointed out early on, we have two air handling units serving the facility. One air handling unit is serving kind of all the spaces that the uh, patient would be in, all the um, proton beam locations, the accelerator, the, the beam transport, that gantry area. And most of those spaces, especially where the proton beam is, need to be exhausted. There's radiation concerns. You don't want radioactive particles getting transferred to other parts of the facility. So we have a lot of exhaust there, but we are making sure uh, when we don't need to cool those spaces at night, we're able to turn down that exhaust, turn down the amount of fresh air that we have to bring in just to, again, save that energy. And then we have, uh, Amy mentioned that, that uh, electrical room or that equipment room that's kind of an L shape on the second floor. That, for all intents and purposes, from a cooling perspective, is like a data center. Um, we have a dedicated air handling unit, a large air handling unit, just for that space alone because there's so much heat load in there. Uh, so that there is just a lot of heat that's produced, a lot of cooling that we need to provide to the system. Uh, other thing to mention from a mechanical perspective is radiation considerations. So you, you see with, with our structure how thick the concrete is, there's a lot of radiation protection. So some of these spaces where there is high, high amounts of radiation. We wanted to be careful that our equipment controllers, that our um, kind of that circuitry does not get damaged by the radiation and need to be replaced frequently. So pretty much all of our controllers, anything that's kind of electronics or the mechanical systems was kept out of the high radiation spaces because again, it, it's gonna break down that equipment pretty quickly. Next slide. 
And then a couple uh, plumbing and fire protection highlights. Uh, one interesting aspect of this project is we have a pretty high water table that was discovered before construction started when we were doing boring on site. Uh, so with this proton therapy, it, it's basically the only below grade portion of this entire facility. And obviously it's a very high dollar amount for the equipment. So we want to make sure that we didn't have uh, water infiltration issues coming into that basement level. So that was something we looked at really closely during design. Uh, what we ended up doing kind of a little bit of a belt and suspenders, but below grade, we have a uh, waterproofing system around all the below grade walls. And then we also have a drain tile system below that lowest level, keeping that water table low. And it's actually a redundant drain tile system. If one of them ever gets clogged, uh, the other one will take over. There's uh, redundant sump pumps that are pumping that out. So again, just redundancy on redundancy to make sure that we never get water leaking into this. Uh, the, the other part, Jim mentioned this with the, uh, the PVC conduit that had to be fiberglass, same thing for plumbing piping. You gotta be careful when this concrete cured, uh, it, it gets to an elevated temperature and Nick will go into a lot more detail on that. We wanted to make sure that there's no damage to the piping when that concrete cures because, I mean, this is the very definition of permanent pipe, right? It's buried inside of a concrete slab that's several feet thick. You're, you're never getting to that again. We need to make sure that there's no damage during construction and also that this could hold up for a long period of time. So it's a epoxy coated cast iron, which is going to last a lot longer. It's going to essentially last the, the life of this facility for the foreseeable future. You won't have any, any holes or anything developing in that piping. And then the last item with the fire protection system, pretty much every single room, every single part of this proton center is high dollar equipment that you don't want to get wet. So throughout this whole area, uh, it's a double interlock reaction system. What that means is if you accidentally hit a sprinkler head and break it, nothing's going to come out. It, the piping is, is dry. It's full of air. So you need a smoke detector and a sprinkler head to go off before any water is actually going to be delivered to the space. I'll turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so now we get to talk about the fun stuff. Um, next slide. So um, on, the, on the construction side of things, and specifically the concrete structure, um, I want to focus primarily since, like Arik mentioned and Kevin and um, Jim mentioned the bulk of the structure, the substantial portion of the structure is the concrete. Um, so I want to focus primarily on that. So today we're going to look at that in a little more detail. Um, we'll go into the mass concrete operations and how we did that, um, which the structure is substantially complete at this point. So we'll give some, some pretty neat photos during the progress here, but we'll talk about kind of what that looked like. Um, but I did want to start off. I, I, we don't have enough time to get through like it's just the, the full, um, level of detail, um, both in, in pre-planning um, and coordination with, you know, with HKS, with IMEG, with this design team, with the owner, with the vendors of the facility. This has been a long time in the making and a lot of coordination. So, uh, so far, you know, so good. And there's going to be a lot of, I mean, hopefully there's a lot of questions at the end, so I'll save some time. We can always circle back. Um, so with that, we'll go to the next slide start to jump into the concrete. So high level overview of the, just the general concrete structure. So as Ark mentioned, and I think, uh, well, Jim and Kevin both alluded to, uh, a lot of concrete, uh, over 6,500 cubic yards in total. Um, so it's over 26 million pounds of concrete and reinforce, uh, reinforcement. Um, and we placed this in total, and I went back and just validated, but placed all this in roughly nine months. So from start to finish, you know, not, not counting obviously the planning ahead of time, um, pretty fast, over 700 yards a month on average placed. So the, the thing I want, did want to highlight here specifically on the cross section, a couple different things. Um, <clears throat> what you can see is the delineation between kind of above, above and below grade. So we're, I'm going to focus quite a bit on the below grade piece, specifically with the mass concrete provisions. Um, we'll touch a little bit on the walls and above, um, but just a unique piece as we look at the cross section, you know, almost half and half, both for the reinforcing and for the uh, concrete split between what's considered below grade, which is really finished floor and down. Um, and primarily the bulk of that is the main grantry treatment room, which Amy had mentioned. Um, and then above grade, we'll talk about the sequence of construction of the walls here as well. So the last thing I did want to point out is just the, the coordination and collaboration with the vendors. So um, there's, there's the rounding the metric to 
um, standard conversions. Uh, with that, that's coordinated and collaborated with all of our vendors as well. So we've got, we're dealing with, you know, steel fabricators uh, for all these concrete embeds that are ultimately uh, set up. They need to be positioned very precisely off of um, our ISO centers, like Arik mentioned. Uh, and they need to be at a precise elevation. They need to be very plumb, very true um, to a certain a certain extent, even sometimes machined to a, a certain level of flatness so that when this equipment comes to be installed, it's it's very accurate. So with the size and the weight of some of this equipment, though, that produced some challenges, which we'll talk about a little bit here. So there's embeds, concrete steel embeds, two inches thick, you know, six feet tall, so the size of a person and wider that are 1,500 pounds. And just the, the challenge of attaching that to a piece of formwork um, keeping it plumb, keeping it true, and keeping it in that right location. We'll, we'll hit on here too. The next slide. Um, I'm not going to spend a great amount of time talking about mass concrete placing. I feel like um, the AAA Chicago, probably a lot of people are familiar with uh, mass concrete and thermal control plans. So just high level overview, what that looks like and how it applied to our projects here um, in Madison. Um, the three main constraints or the two the two biggest things so it's aci 301 uh, we got to keep the maximum internal temperature of that mass concrete we place this foundation in three lifts um, keep the mat keep the internal temperature of the center of that core less than 160 degrees fahrenheit at its peak and then we have to also while doing so and getting that to cool we need to keep the inside center core and the outside surface within 35 degrees fahrenheit which that typically is your biggest challenge um, when and what's considered complete for thermal control and curing, uh, there's three three main pieces there. So those three requirements um, listed. The top two, honestly, are the easy ones to to get to. Um, is to get the the cool, get it to the center to peak and get it to start cooling and to place it. You know, it's got to be sitting there for at least three days. The tricky part and what we ran into here from a schedule standpoint is that center temperature now has to cool. Um, but it can't just start cooling. It's got to cool to be within 35 degrees of the average air you know, ambient temperature. Um, and depending on what time of year that is in Wisconsin, that, that makes things a little bit more challenging. So as we looked at schedule, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, that, that really dictated maybe some of the provisions that we had to do and we'll talk about here. Um, and then with that, uh, we had to place it in lifts and we'll talk about, we'll show some photos of the sequence of that. Other considerations at the time, um, I think we're still seeing this, but there's there's cement supply chain shortage issues. Uh, so there's there's plenty of uh, collaboration with this team to make sure we're hitting dates and coordination, um, but then with our vendors uh, and our, our ready mix companies to make sure that we had that enough cement on hand uh, and be able to shut down some batch plants for days to, to get some of this placed. So next slide. So this is just a quick overview of the, the prescribed thermal control plan. Um, the, the big highlight here, so on the left, you'll see this is without internal cooling. On the right is with inter internal cooling. I'll go a little bit more into what that looks like. So big highlight, there's about a 20 day delta from not using cooling to using cooling. And that is per lift of foundation. So three lifts, you can do the math. That's almost nine weeks of schedule. Um, that would be not, not optimal. So next slide. Uh, so we ended up uh, based on facility readiness date requirements um, and what the you know owner's contract was, UW Health with our vendors, uh, we decided to move forward with the cooling. So what you can see here is our cross section uh, of what that concrete is. And we'll talk a little bit more about the sequence there. You can see some additional concrete that was placed for forming and for waterproofing. Um, but high level, what this amounted to was a closed loop, cool, uh, cool water system, chilled water system. Um, so there's two layers at three foot spacing, roughly three foot apart. And you can see the cross section there um, run through in multiple loops and a one inch diameter piping. Uh, we use food safe glycol for at pumping and circulating through there for 40 to, 50, 40 to 50 degrees. And in actuality, like we saw on the previous slide, we were able to meet our thermal control requirements and mass concrete requirements in that one week duration. So all in all, it worked. Uh, next slide, you can see some pictures. Um, this is also one of those massive embeds and kind of showing you where that goes. Uh, so again, placing that, you know, we got 1800 cubic yard pour that we're going on here and getting that to stay 
plum true. Uh, and then on the bottom uh, bottom of the screen in the photo and then the bottom right, you can see what that temporary chiller and temporary generator uh, were. And then you can kind of see um, the manifold, so uh, how the supply and return worked to circulate that water there too. So a reminder on the embed and maybe just a, a, another shout out from a coordination standpoint. Um, so fabricator for the steel modeling in Tecla, um, utilizing concrete, uh, you know, Tecla, Tecla structures for modeling our concrete and concrete forming systems to that fabrication level of detail. Uh, and then sharing that through Trimble Connect was, um, I guess I would say, priceless as it relates to getting this coordinated to that precise level of detail. So next slide here. And then just some uh, quickly kind of go through some photos. And again, we'll save some time for questions. So if you've got anything you want to circle back to, we can definitely do that. Just some things to note. So this is as the footprint you can kind of see on the left photo, um, the overall footprint of the site, but then it starts with that base lower pit. So this is the foundation lift number one. Uh, on the right, you can see what that looks like in terms of there's a sub, a, a sub, uh, some pit at the base of that. So there was a preliminary pour. And what you see on the left is the is actually a mud slab. And we'll talk a little bit more what why that was required. On the right, you can see the edge forming. And then as Kevin mentioned, so we had an earth retention system, and then we had some dewatering both in a temporary state and then as we backfilled in that permanent state. Next slide. So some more progress photos. This is kind of going from this is the placement of that first bottom lift uh, and then going into the uh, backfill ex uh, exercises essentially to get to the second lift. Again, maintaining the dewatering system. And next, this is some good, uh, I guess, progress photos of the waterproofing. So this is another challenge. Uh, we have a dewatering system based, you know, with piping and mechanical dewatering system, but then also uh, had to wrap uh, like you do with a lot of times with an elevator sump pit or an elevator pit. So pre-proofing and waterproofing. The way we had to do that, um, but you, and you can kind of see it here, on the left side of the form, on the right picture on the left side of the formwork, you can see there's concrete. So we placed the bottom mud slab, then we placed our formwork, placed a layer of insulation for a thermal control, um, pre-proofed, so waterproof that structure. Uh, and then, which I think you'll see in the next photo, well, maybe not. Um, so then what we ended up having to do on top of that waterproofing to hold it in place and to allow us to do some different things with um, precisely locating, laying out, and placing not only formwork, but the pipe, the conduit, um, everything that needed to be precisely located. We could do that. So we placed a six inch layer of sacrificial, um, about 3000 PSI or less concrete on top of that waterproofing. And this was coordinated. So obviously increases the geometry coordinated directly with our partners at HKS and IMEG to understand what that looks like and how that reacts uh, with the full system. But that was placed to be able to do that layout, to place your rebar chairs on top of that without penetrating the waterproofing, right? Because it doesn't do us any good if, if we're mounting pipe stands and things directly to waterproofing, that really doesn't do us any good. Uh, next slide. So that was showing kind of the preparation to get to this final lift. This is, uh, we'll just have a couple photos here that's just going to go through uh, what that looked like from a sequence standpoint. So on the left photo, you can see this is a 3 a.m. start and setup. Um, we had two uh, placing pumps and one conveyor um, that were basically on site by 3 a.m. We had a backup pump uh, on standby on site. Um, to start off, we were placing at roughly 300 cubic yards an hour. So let's uh, give it 30 to 35 trucks circulating through the site. You can see on the, on the photo on the right during that placing, I think this is just as the conveyor is done. Uh, you can see two trucks and there's at any given time, there were six trucks um, discharging. So next, some drone footage uh, from that poor date uh, on the left. Uh, you can see we're starting to top out. So this is roughly one o'clock. So this is nine hours uh, straight of placing. Uh, and you can see uh, the right photo, which is a really nice top down view. You can see the uh, vertical reinforcing. So you can actually see the out outline of that uh, structure where the wall lines go uh, and see the pit that was the, the bottom piece. And next we'll look at 
just a quick overview of the concrete walls. So top-down view of the walls in progress. Uh, on the top right picture, you can kind of see what I'm trying to dictate here or show on the bottom right is a diagram. And this was the placing, partially thermal, partially due to shrinkage uh, placing plan. You can see based on the numbering uh, and based on the sequence in the plans there that we had to jump. Uh, we couldn't place wall pores directly adjacent to the previous wall pore. So we had to give at least three days for concrete to cure shrink before we could strip it, strip the forms and, and cycle them. Uh, not to mention, you know, this isn't just a standard rectangle. You know, it's it's a lot more complex. There's a lot of uh, different geometry that we need to coordinate coordinate with, uh, as well as the number of sleeves for piping conduit uh, and the embed, embedded steel. So next slide, you can see a little bit more detail of the intricacies. So on the left is the fourth pour. So that corresponds to the little key in the middle. Um, you can see that's a pretty unique shape, different wall thicknesses, uh, different geometry. And on the right was our first pour. So these two pours, as you can see on the top, were directly adjacent to one another, but they were poured almost three weeks apart uh, due to how we had to cycle through the formwork and get the uh, concrete to cure. Next. So here's just a couple further down the line progress photos of the structural deck. Um, you can imagine quite a bit of concrete. This is roughly a six foot thick structural deck. So a little bit more above and beyond what you typically would do to shore that. Uh, on the right, you can see more of the completed version of that with the high walls going in around the gantry room specifically. Next slide. And then here you can see uh, the forming of that high walls, which is where and on, on the right, you can see where that's stripped out and we're cleaning that out. Um, and that's where Arik had pointed out. This is where uh, the temporary gantry crane uh, currently sits uh, with a temporary roof over it. And then ultimately, once the once the equipment is placed by our vendor, uh, that temporary roof goes away and we place 33, roughly 40,000 pound, 40 foot long precast uh, beams in here to close up that lid. Next, just really quickly. So like I mentioned, there is other structure. Uh, the steel portion, a lot simpler. It's really just to, to provide that upper second level roof uh, which is really more or less for primarily equipment and back of house space. And next should be my last. So this is the precast. So another unique feature and maybe not as cool to some, but it would be really cool to some. Uh, so the precast uh, went up in December, uh, some pretty unique uh, detail in that south elevation, uh, ultimately a pretty good looking thing. I think it really, you know, hides our beautiful concrete work, but uh, I think Arc agrees too. Uh, otherwise, current status, so roof is roof is on, roof is complete. Our temporary gantry crane is over uh, our gantry treatment space uh, with the uh, interior rough ends basically going and drywall They're all progressing as we work towards facility ready in estate number one here in a couple of months. That's it for me. All right, everyone, thank you so much. If you have any questions? There's a few in the chat I'll run through. If anyone has um, questions they want to ask our presenters here, go ahead and put it in the Q&A feature and we'll answer them live. Okay, let's see here. All right, one, why are there prep recovery rooms in the plan? Are all patients sedated? Um, no, not all patients are sedated. That is for P prep recovery, so for pediatric patients. Um, and it, the procedure isn't painful. It's more just to make sure they're laying still during the procedure. And that only occurs um, in the gantry room where there's you know a table for them to lay on. Uh, they're brought in and then anesthesia is administered and then they are taken back to those two peds prep recovery. Perfect, thank you. And then this one is for Jim. Uh, can you please comment on the redundancy plan for HVAC and power? Notice the dedicated service transformer and dedicated AH, uh, air handling unit in the center. Yeah, from a, uh, from a redundancy standpoint, uh, we do have multiple generators on site that are serving critical functions, Kevin's air handlers for one, but uh, the, uh, the UPS I mentioned in there serves the critical data functions the patient information and all the controls that run the uh, the proton therapy. 
that's the level of redundancy we have. We Again, like I said, we cannot actually fire the proton beam while we're on emergency power. It's only when full normal power is available. And our utility system to the site is very robust. We certainly don't anticipate outages, but if we do, uh, again, the UPS supports all of the control functions to get it back up and running pretty rapidly. And then within the air handlers themselves, there's redundancy in the fans. We can lose any any one fan in any air handler and continue operation as normal as well. Okay, let's see, here's another one. Um, how long do the procedures typically last? Amy, you're on mute. Uh, each pr procedure is about 20 minutes, but that 20 minutes is really just for the therapist to get the patient in the room, get them set up in the table or the chair. Uh, usually there's an immobilization device similar to a linear accelerator to get them in the exact position. And then the, the treatment is, is literally seconds, um, but then to get them back out of the room. So patients kind of rotate through the room every 20 minutes. All right, any other questions? We have a few minutes left here. All right, one more here. Okay, and yes, this is a question. Um, we will be sharing the recording um, of this. So if you wanna go back and re-listen, and if there are any questions that pop up from there, you can let us know. We can certainly um, get those to the appropriate people. And uh, just as a reminder, um, this presentation um, is uh, worth one uh, health safety and wellness credit. So if you um, <clears throat> did attend our presentation today, um, please reach out to AIA Chicago if you do not receive notification of your credit. Great. So with that, um, I think we will wrap up our presentation for today. Um, very thorough and well thought out presentation. And, and thank you again so much to our team here um, who walked us through um, construction and planning and implementation of this uh, phenomenal project. Um, thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Have Thank a you. Great Thank day, you. everyone. Thanks. Bye. All right. Closed out. Yeah, there was one job. more that popped in here. Okay. Oh, right. sorry, I didn't see it before we closed. No, up. I no, just it, didn't want to have dead air. I'm like, okay, we're done. <laughs> no, I agree. It was about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was a very thorough presentation. So, you know, we could say it was that. A lot of information. It was a lot of information. And um, it was, uh, yeah, really great, thorough, and uh, just gives you a lot, of, a lot to think about. So. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. I will follow up with all the information. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Love right. you. Bye. Bye, guys.